Good morning, everyone. Special welcome to those watching around the world. My thanks to Global Sepsis Alliance and the German Sepsis Foundation for inviting me to give this keynote address here this morning. And thank you, Conrad, for your warm welcome and your international inspirational leadership over the last number of years. Yes, we met here 10 years ago and we launched the initiative. And since then, over 1 million people have died in Germany of sepsis. And 3.5 million Americans have died of sepsis in those 10 years. For those of you who do not know me, my name is Kieran Staunton, my wife Orla, and our daughter Kathleen, and I buried our 12-year-old son, Rory, 10 years ago from undiagnosed and untreated sepsis, who died at a major New York City hospital. Rory was a very healthy child, he was five foot nine. He was 160 pounds or 72 kilograms. One day he scraped his arm while playing in school. Overnight he spiked a fever. The next day we brought him to the hospital and the pediatrician and the emergency department where each medical professional examined him, dismissed our concerns and sent him home with a diagnosis for gastric flu. Rory, however, was very sick and the following day, his symptoms worsened. We returned to the hospital where he was admitted to the ICU. That was Friday evening. At six o'clock on that Sunday, our beautiful son died. An unnecessary and preventable death. When we were told that Rory died from sepsis, we had never heard of the word. In fact, as Rory lay dying in the hospital that weekend, the word sepsis was never once mentioned to us. If Rory had received the correct diagnosis and treatment, he would be alive today. I have given many speeches in the last 10 years about Rory's death, but I'll never be able to verbalize the, the agonizing pain, the, the hardship and the torture that comes with the loss of our child. And the struggle to keep going, especially when we think Rory's life could have been saved. His death was totally preventable. I'm sorry, I just, I'm, I'm meant to go on to a um, graph here. I think this is, I hope I'm doing it right. Okay. That's it, right? This one. Okay, I'm sorry. Okay. Tragically, since Rory's death, we have heard different versions of his story repeated again and again. Families who never heard from sepsis, their concerns dismissed by healthcare providers, lives cut short families broken. After Rory's death, we learned that in the United States alone, sepsis kills over 350,000 people a year. It kills more Americans than AIDS, breast cancer, prostate cancer, and opioids combined. And yet we had never heard of it. Shortly after Rory died, my wife Orla and I established in sepsis the legacy of Rory Staunton. Our goal was to ensure that what happened to our family would never happen again. And you will see this slide here that's behind you. We actually got that, that graph made up. We delivered that to every member of the House of Congress to shock people into saying, here it is. And they said, well, why didn't we hear of it? We prevent, presented that to everyone. That's an indictment of you, not of us.
What we discovered about sepsis in the United States, there was no federal, state or city government policy or mandated measures on sepsis whatsoever. There was no widespread use of hospital protocols. The CDC had no policy or directives on sepsis and no campaigns to improve public awareness. There was no sepsis education in schools. The internet was almost silent on the subject. In a nutshell, in the United States, when our son died, there was no template or plan how to tackle this killer in our midst. We had to start from scratch. Here's some of what we achieved in 10 years and what we hope to achieve moving forward in America and beyond. First, I'd like to address the issue of personal stories in this fight. After Rory died, we told our story repeatedly to national and international media. Rory's story was written about on the front page of the New York Times and other major publications. We realized that it was very hard for policymakers and decision makers to ignore the plight and the pleas of heartbroken parents and children. We formed the National Family Council on Sepsis, a coalition of impacted families as a unifying force, bring them together, be their voice, and we are their voice. We took our campaign to Washington. There was no doors open for us. We had to push them all in or kick them all in. We knocked on doors, we shared our story, we prevented graphs, we asked why nothing was being done. As a result, the United States Senate held its very first ever hearing on sepsis in 2014, where I testified. We engaged with the CDC. After Rory's death, we visited the CDC website, desperate to understand what this sepsis was, what had killed our child. And we found nothing on the CDC A to Z website for sepsis. No information on the condition that was killing hundreds of thousands of Americans. When we visited their place in Atlanta, they had nothing printed in the building on sepsis. The only printed material in the building was a pamphlet that we brought in with us that day. To us, this om omission cut to the heart of the sepsis problem. It was a crisis that most people seemed to be doing their best to ignore. In 2013, we held the very first national forum on sepsis in Washington. For the first time ever, this was done. We brought the politicians, the federal agencies, the patient advocates, the decision makers, and we put them all into one room. We put them talking. How could they deal with an issue if they weren't talking to each other about it? We put them into the one room, and we've done it every year since. Dr. Reinhardt was one of the speakers. Back in New York State, our work focused on changing hospital policies to ensure that when a patient with sepsis enters a hospital, they are met with healthcare professionals who know how to identify and treat sepsis, something Rory was denied. Our, our previous speaker also spoke about how many doctors looked at his wife, an unborn child, for many hours and all the symptoms and they didn't know what they were dealing with. We formed a coalition of agencies and organizations to tackle the issue of sepsis. These efforts resulted in Rory's regulations, as they are known. And that requires hospitals to develop evidence-based protocols for their early identification and treatment of sepsis and submit them to the New York State Department of Health for approval. Edu educate providers on the protocols. Publicly report the outcomes. These protocols ensure the rapid diagnosis and treatment of sepsis with antibiotics and fluids, and most importantly, include an accountability mechanism that is often missing from this kind of measure. Rory's regulations require that the Department of Health audit all hospitals, report data back to the hospitals quarterly to foster local improvement. It is crucial that these measures are compulsory and that accountability is in place because voluntary doesn't count. 
The hospital that our son died in had a voluntary sepsis initiative in place. They didn't get around to using it because it was voluntary. Voluntary is left to them. It shouldn't be. Not when it comes to someone's life. Going forward, it's either compulsory, it's mandatory, or then you're just changing one form with another and you're bringing on death. Voluntary to me is just in death in another area. It needs to be compulsory. The regulations also include a parent's bill of rights designed to, design to improve communications with parents and caregivers to ensure that test results are received, reviewed before discharge, something that would certainly have saved Rory's life. We now know that Rory's regulations in New York alone saved over 16,000 lives in New York between 2015 and 2019. So if someone says to us, regulations are, do not work, are there a chance that there's something else, there are 16,000 New Yorkers walking alive today that will be dead but for Rory's regulations. That is a testimony to itself. Furthermore, paediatric mortality decreased by 40% when the treatment bundle was administered within an hour of sepsis recognition. Another important policy shift in New York State has been the creation of Roy Staunton's law. This requires all professionals working in a healthcare-related profession to undertake infection prevention training. Rory Staunton's law in New York now covers more than 460,000 workers across the state. And by the way, an awful lot of the work that we have given and the stats and everything we knew in New York came from a lot of hard grafting by people who are working for the New York State Department of Health. One of them is led by someone who's here today and will speak later. His work is, is, is remarkable. Dr. Marcus Friedrich, I want to recognize you for all your work. Thank you very much, and I know you're going to speak later. And God bless you. It's, it takes a person to lead. Federal action. New York's regulations are America's most effective policies to date. We know the real solution is nationally mandated approach to the identification and treatment of sepsis and funds and resources. In short, we are fighting for sepsis to be treated as a national health crisis that it is. And there is reason for this optimism. In sepsis is currently working with the stellar group of leaders we have put together across the United States about ending the sepsis crisis. We have worked to create a framework for a national approach to sepsis, with funding crucially attached, have held meetings at the highest level of the United States government to build consensus. We will soon be making announcements about this work in the very near future. Also on September the 13th this year, World Sepsis Day, Senator Charles Sumer, the leader of the United States Senate, spoke on the Senate floor the first time ever about sepsis. He spoke about the gravity of the crisis, the need for a national approach to combat it. He urged federal officials to do better and strongly advocated for Roy's regulations as, as a national guideline. He also, in the United States, in a bipartisan measure, both parties took the leadership, have allocated that September the 13th going forward in the United States shall be known as National Sepsis Day. These are many firsts with big implications. Of course, strong policy initiatives are only half the battle. We now know that in the United States, sepsis originates outside the hospital. I think this is very important for everyone because over the years, people say sepsis was hospital-acquired, health-acquired. 87% of the cases in the United States happen in the community. They had it when they walked into the hospital. Our public awareness initiatives rely heavily on personal stories. Our awareness strategy includes traditional media, PSAs, compelling social media. We have developed relationships with healthcare groups, labor unions, professional associations to share our measure. Most recently, we developed a major campaign to increase awareness of maternal sepsis among patients and providers. And this is what's fairly frightening. The US has the highest rate of maternal sepsis of any wealthy nation. And sepsis is the second leading cause of maternal death. With funding we got from the federal government, we worked with New York State Department of Health to identify and produce educational materials to those at higher risk. These include pregnant women of color, very young pregnant people, and those who want to under C-section deliveries. We partnered with the major teachers union, nurses unions, and others to develop a K through 12 through education curriculum that teaches children about infection. 
Over 3 million New York children have access to this. It's free. It is also available nationally. The challenge of separateness differs in each country, but it's the same killer in every country. We believe that some of our approaches can be implemented by other groups across the world. We believe the recommendations could be lead with personal stories, reach people through grief and heartbreak, refuse to be sidelined and silenced, refuse to be ignored, commit to holding leaders accountable, whether they're elected leaders, appointed leaders, medical leaders, or other leaders. We deserve to have our children and our loved ones living. We shouldn't be buying coffins for our children and our parents and our unborn children and our wives. Demand a national response to sepsis. Work to ensure that everyone can identify the signs of sepsis and seek a medical, a medical treatment. We call on all government and public health communities to step up and change behavior. We look forward to working closely with Global Alliance and other organizations. In the USA, we have created a template. It has saved lives. Remember, we're not waiting for a cure for sepsis here. We're waiting for leadership. We're waiting for people to step up. We're waiting for people to do for sepsis what they've done for everything else. Why shouldn't our loved ones have that right? The urgency is now, and make sepsis a national and global priority is something that we fully stand behind. So we're right behind with you, Conrad. We're right behind everyone, and we need to bring this thing to fruition. We've addressed the WHO. We've addressed all the groups. Ten years later, too many coffins, too many deaths, too many loved ones. We lost 25% of our family to sepsis. Our earlier speaker lost their families and loved ones. Let's get this thing moving. And let's get it together. Thank you very much for your time. Upwards and onwards. Garmila Mahagav Galeer. Thank you very much.